Good morning. It is so good to have each and every one of you with us here this morning as we continue in our study in the book of Amos. So I'd invite you to grab your Bible and and open it up to the book of Amos, uh, starting in chapter 3, verse 1, is where we'll begin this morning. But let's always, uh, as always, let's begin our study with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we praise you. We thank you, Lord, for giving us another day to, to live it with you and, and to commune with you, Lord, as we study your word. Lord, we ask that you've got our hearts in this as we do so. Lord, help us to learn from these passages that hold your timeless truths, to help us to know how it is that you would have us to live and, and to conduct ourselves as those who have repented of our sins and believed in your son, Jesus. Lord God, our hearts now, we give you the honor and the glory and the praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Alrighty. Now, Amos speaks to the 10 northern tribes of Israel about their judgment by God for their past 200 years of rampant idolatry and corresponding sinfulness. The Lord with LORD being in all caps, and you'll notice that throughout these verses, the LORD seeks His, now, seeks his people whenever we wander away from Him. The LORD being in all caps represents God's covenant name, the Hebrew word or name, Yahweh. This is God's name that He gave to Moses from the burning bush and commanded Moses that this would be the name by which those who were in covenant with him could call him. That name means, I am the I am. Jesus called himself by that name as well under the new covenant. Just like God, a shepherd seeks out his sheep. When his sheep wander away from him, the sheep being the ones that he cares about the most, the ones he wants to guide and protect, when they wander away from him, the shepherd goes and finds his sheep and brings them back to safety. There are terrible consequences for the good shepherd's sheep who refuse to return to him. It's an individual decision on whether to return to the shepherd or not. Those who do not return will fall outside of the shepherd's blessings and his protection, and they will perish. Jesus called himself the good shepherd under his covenant with us, the Son of God, Jesus. Let's, let's go and, and on into our passage now, and I'll show you how this, this relates to us today in our world. God pronounces from his throne of judgment against the ten northern tribes of Israel, who had actually retained the name Israel, the two southern tribes that had called themselves Judah in favor of the much larger tribe of Judah. Okay. And we see in verses 1 and 2, God's condemnation on the ten northern tribes. In verses 1 and 2, we read, Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. The, the Hebrew word for iniquities means twisted, okay? They had been bent away from God's ways, and they were twisted in their practice of evil. 
They were twisted toward evil and away from the Lord, in all caps, their covenant Lord and his written word. Okay. Now, because of this iniquity, Amos brings a series of three messages to the children of Israel. Now, what we need to know is that God is in covenant today with his people who have been called by his name or called Christians. Okay. He brings these same warnings to us who go by the name of Jesus Christ, but do not live by his name. God says to them, hear this word that the Lord has spoken. In, he said, and he also says, listen to this message, as it's translated in the Christian Standard Bible. God's Word, the Bible, is our sole source of absolute truth and has been always, all the way back to the people of Israel, 1,400 plus years before Christ, God gave His written Word in His law to Moses, Prophet Moses, and Moses wrote those words down. This is our guideline for living. In John 8, 31 through 32, Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, who professed to believe in him, maybe I should say that, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth. And the truth shall set you free. Our freedom as believers in our covenant relationship with God is gained by living according to God's word and striving to do that and asking for forgiveness from God whenever we do not abide by his word. The only way we're going to know that is to study. His word. Jesus tells us that each person will someday stand before God's judgment seat and be judged on how, how well he or she has lived according to his word, the truth. We cannot live according to God's word except that we have repented and believed, and God's Holy Spirit has come to take residence within us and helps us and guides us in living our life according to his word. The Hebrew word transmitted iniquities, as I said, means bent. We need to keep ourselves bent toward God's word, as we're doing right now in studying this passage. The Lord promises for every person standing before his judgment seat, I will punish you for all of your iniquities. Now, iniquities is speaking of things, uh, that ways that we are bent, the way that we have turned our lives in the wrong direction. Okay, let's, let's go a little further and let's look at verses three through five. Amos says to the people of Israel, can two walk to let together unless they are agreed? Will a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? Will a young lion cry out of his den if he has caught nothing? Will a bird fall into a snare on the earth where there is no trap for it? Will a snare spring up from the earth if it is caught nothing at all? If a trumpet is blown in a city, will not the people be afraid? If there is calamity in a city, will not the Lord have done it? Now let's look at this. The Lord was targeting Israel in such a scrupulous way because of the privileges he had given his chosen people through his word of truth. Israel alone had experienced the Lord's manifest presence and provision or blessings or deliverance and had received his word of truth 
through his prophets, beginning with Moses. And now, through Amos, we studied in our study of 2 Kings, through Isaiah, these prophets bring the word of God to our hearts and our minds and expose our, our bents, the way we're bent in the way we live our lives. The Lord asked Israel seven rhetorical questions with obvious answers. The seventh question, verse 6, reveals that God himself would cause the calamities brought with the Assyrian armies as his instruments of judgment against Israel's iniquities and against his written word of truth, the law. Why? Because they would not repent. They would not turn themselves back to the Lord and seek to live life his ways. The Lord asked these questions, and he says, If a trumpet is blown in a city, will not the people be afraid? If there is a calamity in a city, will not the Lord have done it? In the ancient world, the sounding of a horn had an immediate fear-inducing impact. We see that spoken of in Leviticus 25.9. Military leaders used to blast a ram's horn to direct their warriors during an attack and during a war. We see that in Joel 2.15. For citizens huddled inside the city walls for safety, the bellowing sound meant only one thing. The enemy was striking. And we see this in Jeremiah 421 with reference to the southern kingdom of Judah, and we see it now in Amos 636 in terms of the northern kingdom of Israel. In Amos 3, 7 through 8, let's let's read on. Surely the Lord does nothing unless he reveals his secrets, his secret to his servants, the prophets. A lion has roared. Who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, but who can prophesy? The prophet continues, prophet Amos continues with this series of rhetorical questions. Begun in verse 3, designed to convince his hearers that the Lord was warning them of a coming judgment if they did not respond promptly and appropriately by repenting, turning back to God. Okay. The Lord God's righteous judgment would result in disasters of which God's people should be made fully aware as written in the law of God. And we see in Leviticus chapter 26 and Deuteronomy 28, approximately 600 years previous to this, as the the prophet Moses speaks to the people of Israel before they entered into their promised land. Now that they are there, 10 of the 12 tribes have wandered dramatically astray from God and were bent away from God. Okay, and so let's look at a few of these and see what God told them 600 years previously through the prophet Moses. Leviticus 26, 27 through 28 say, And after all this, if you do not obey me, but walk contrary to me, then I will also walk contrary to you in fury. And I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. Now, the number seven, seven times means God will, will, in his judgment, he will deal out punishment that is that corresponds with the sins that were committed. Okay? Now, you got to remember that God is a holy God. He is perfectly righteous. So, any sin that a person commits 
willfully in, re, in refusal to repent or confess this sin to God will be met with a resounding judgment. That judgment is going to be death or separation from the Holy God. The prophet Moses in Leviticus 26, 27, and 28 wrote of diseases that were sent from God. Let's look at that. And after all this, if you do not obey me, but walk contrary to me, then also will walk. Then I also will walk contrary to you in fury, and I even I will chastise you seven times for your sins. Now we go down to Deuteronomy twenty-eight twenty-two, and the prophet Moses wrote of terrible diseases sent from God. Let me read that to you. The Lord will strike you with consumption, with fever, with inflammation, with severe burning fever, with, with the sword, with scorching, and with mildew, and they shall per pursue you until you perish. Your carcass shall be food for the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and no one shall frighten them away. The Lord will strike you with the with boils of Egypt for, from a foreign country. In other words, God will strike us with a disease from a foreign country. Does that sound familiar? He'll strike us with tumors, with the scab, and with the itch from which you cannot be healed. In other words, you're going to die of this disease. Okay. Now, Second thing that God says is that he will send terrible droughts in Deuteronomy 28, 23, and 24. God says, And your heavens which are over your head shall be bronze, and the earth which is under you shall be iron. The Lord will change the rain of your land to powder and dust. From heaven it shall come down upon you until you are destroyed. The United States of America has been under a terrible drought for the last five or six years. Sign from God? Very possibly. The next thing God promises, the third thing he promises is God will place over you political leaders who will make foolish and disastrous decisions, Deuteronomy 28, 28 through 29. Does that sound familiar? Politicians who make foolish and disastrous decisions. The Lord will strike you with madness and blindness and confusion of heart, and you shall grope at noonday as a blind man gropes in darkness. You shall not prosper in your ways. You shall only be oppressed and plundered continually, and no one shall save you. Finally, in Leviticus 26, 29 through 30, God will allow invading armies to come into your land and shall place your cities under siege. In Leviticus 26, 31 through 32, it goes on to tell us that the invading army shall destroy your cities and kill your people, taking your lands and homes and live in them. Leviticus 26, 33, God says, I will scatter you among the nations. And in Deuteronomy 28, 32 through 33, God says that your sons and your daughters shall be given to other people, and your eyes shall not look and fall with longing, with longing for them all day long. And there shall be no strength in your hand. A nation whom you have not known shall eat the fruit of your land and the produce of your labor, and you shall be only oppressed and crushed continually. Let's come down and look at verse 7. 
Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. We were just reading from the writings of the prophet Moses to the people of Israel before they even entered into their promised land. But now that they've been in their promised land for over 600 years, The Lord reminds them of this, that he has sent prophets. The Lord would be faithful to his word in judging his people's persistent disobedience. But he would also act righteously in warning his people through his servants, the prophets. The scriptures preserved and taught by the priests were an essential means of keeping God's instruction before his people. We said that in Ezekiel 44 and Malachi 2. But God has revealed his secret to spirit-filled prophets, as we see in Nehemiah 9.30. Now in verse 8, God asks, A lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord has spoken, who can but prophesy? Amos echoed chapter 1, verse 2, where we, where we looked last week, and he announced the lion has roared. If the Israelites had any spiritual discernment, they would realize the urgency of the 8th century prophets that were going to come in sequence. First Amos, then Jonah, then Hosea, then Micah, and then Isaiah. If the people were wise, they would fear their warnings from God as the lion roars from Jerusalem, as we saw in last week's lesson, as God roars from his temple in judgment over the northern kingdom. Let's come down to verses 9 through 10. Chapter 3. Proclaim in the palaces of Ashdod and in the palaces of the land of Egypt and say, assemble on the mountains of Samaria, see great tumults in her midst and, he, and the oppressed within her, for they do not do what is right, says the Lord, who store up violence and robbery in their palaces. Now, Ashdod was one of the largest cities of Philistia, which run along the western and southern borders of Judah and Dan. Egypt was south of Judah and Simeon. These pagan nations of Philistia and Egypt worshipped idols. There was no doubt about that. Multiple, many idols. And they do not know the written word of God that he has given to his covenant people, Israel. The pagan nations can be expected to be violent and to enslave and oppress the poor. It's just like Russia today. They, these pagan nations should be expected to do these things that they do because they don't know God. They do not care about his written word whatsoever. They cannot practice righteousness because they do not know right from wrong. They practice violence and robbery while they live in palaces on the money they have stolen from the poor. Verse 11, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, an adversary shall be all around the land. He shall sap your strength from you and your practices, your palaces, I'm sorry, shall be plundered. God produces and pronounces that an adversary shall be all around the land of Israel while they are in their sinful state. The only time that they weren't that way was during the times of David and the early years of Solomon. God will unleash on the northern kingdom of Israel. Looking back in retrospect, we see that God will unleash the nation of Assyria, 
to be a powerful adversary because Israel refused to repent of their sins. And when confronted with the righteousness of God's law, they would lose their nation to their pagan adversaries as God brought them before him in righteous judgment against their sin. Verse 12, thus says the Lord, as a shepherd takes from the mouth of a lion two legs or a piece of an ear, so that the children of Israel be taken out who dwell in Samaria in the corner of a bed on the, on the edge of a couch. They will be killed. Of the once great nation of Israel under David and Solomon, God would save only a mutilated remnant to accomplish his redemptive purposes and keep his covenant promises. The greatest of those covenant promises is that this small remnant of Israel within Judah, not the entire tribe of Judah, but some small remnant that he would preserve through this small remnant of Judah, God would bring his promised Messiah. We see that promise spoken in by Jacob as he's blessing his sons. He comes to his son Judah and he pronounces in four, Genesis 49, 9 through 10, that his through, G, through Judah, the tribe of Judah, would come the lion of Judah, the lion that would roar, the lion that would pronounce judgment, the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, Jesus. Come to down to verse, verse 13. Hear and testify against the house of Jacob, says the Lord God, the God of hosts. That word host can be translated armies. Okay. Uh, God is, is in control of all things in the heaven, in, in the heavens and on the earth. And, and he does certainly control world events, even in our day. Know that nothing happens except that God has allowed it. In Amos 3, 9, the dual commands to hear and testify are directed to the pagan nations of Philistia and Egypt. These witnesses from Israel are called to stand and to testify to the Lord's case against the house of Jacob, Israel. And these witnesses now, oddly enough, are pagan nations that God is going to use according to his purpose to administer justice against his covenant people who have turned away from him and refused to follow him and used to refuse to obey his written word. The charges that God brings are summarized in verse 10. For they do not know to do right, says the Lord, who store up violence and robbery in their palaces. The punishment is described now in verses 11 through 15. The judgment is the declaration of the Lord God, the God of hosts. Verse, let's look at verse 14. This is God's judgment, his declaration. That in the day I punish Israel for their transgressions, I will also visit destruction on the altars of Bethel, and the horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground. Consistent with his title, the Lord Yahweh, would summon violent forces to bring justice to bear against Israel. This is a reference to the sanctuaries to the golden calves built at Bethel and Dan by Jeroboam. When the nation, northern ten tribes broke away from Judah and Benjamin in the south, apparently the sanctuary of Dan had already been destroyed when Aram took control of the northern parts of Israel because it's not no longer mentioned after that. 
The sanctuary at Bethel became a royal sanctuary. Its priesthood was not the tribe of Levi and the descendants of Aaron as commanded by God's law in his tabernacle or his temple or his place of residence. Okay. The priests at Bethel and Dan were supported by the kings of Israel, of the 10 northern tribes, the first one being King Jeroboam. Even the last refuge of a condemned man. Now, let me let me talk to you a minute. The altar in the temple of God where sacrifices of animals were accepted by God on that altar as forgiveness of sin. If a person was being judged unjustly, he could run into the temple and he could grab a hold of the horns of that altar where he had personally offered his sacrifice for his sins, knowing that he's forgiven by God for his sins. He could hold on to that altar and claim that forgiveness. And he was not supposed to be killed when he was holding on to the altar of God. But God says that that doesn't work for these pagan altars that the people of Israel built in Dan and Bethel because they were made to idols. And the sacrifice, sacrifices offered in those altars meant nothing. And there was no, and God said he would break off the horns. So there was nothing for a person to grab a hold of and claim to be forgiven by God. Not on those altars. Are you, are you understanding it? The picture God paints. Now let's come down to verse 15. I will destroy the winter house along with the summer house. The houses of ivory shall perish, and the great houses shall have an end, says the Lord. Implied in this charge against those who were wealthy and owned two residences was the likelihood that the wealthy landowners had gained at least one of their properties by defrauding a less wealthy Israelite landowner of family lands. Now, let me tell you why that's probably true. When the people of Israel all came into their promised land, each family was given a piece of land in Israel, and all the land was divided up amongst the families. And that family was to hold on to that land forever. It was their promised land, their promised piece of property. And somebody else had another home in another part of Israel that was on another piece of land. It belonged to somebody else. It didn't belong to that person. Okay, you understand? Follow me? So the Lord declared that unjust manipulations arranged between greedy elite and an equally corrupt judge would not stand in the courts of God. These were great, quote, great houses, but like everything on earth, they were going to pass away. They would pass under God's judgment. Jesus said in Luke 21, 33, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's God's words which will not pass away. Lean on those. Believe those. Let's look at Let's go to chapter 4 now and look at verse 1. Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountains of Samaria, who oppose the poor, who crush the needy, who say to their husbands, bring wine, let us drink. By the words, you cows, connected with the Lord God, is referring to the women of Samaria, pointing to their personal indulgences at the expense of others, which God would judge. The Lord God was going to exact 
punishment on these women for their indulgences by addressing the wealthy women of Samaria as you cows of Bashan, we see Amos's agrarian culture. The region in Israel, known as Bashan, is located east of the Sea of Kinnereth or the Sea of Galilee. It's called Kinnereth in the Old Testament. It's called Galilee in the New Testament. But the area east of the, the, the Sea of Galilee, stretching eastward onto about 37 miles to Mount Bashan, B-A-S-H-A-N, Bashan, on the edge of the Arabian Desert. So it goes, that stretches a long ways, all the way from the Sea of Galilee to the Arabian Desert. Okay, Bashan runs, then runs north-south about 56 miles from Mount Hermon to just south of the Yarmouk River. Bashan contained wide open plains with an exceptionally fertile soil. It served a one it served as one of Israel's bread baskets and wheat was the primary crop. Now when wheat plants are young they look like grass, like terrific grass, okay, tall grass. And cattle are allowed to just graze on wheat until it begins to grow stalks and get tall, okay? It actually changes color then too. That's how you, the farmer can tell. The cows of Bashan, therefore, had these huge areas to, to roam and graze without concern for who owned the land or the wheat upon which they were grazing and who was someday going to harvest it. Then Amos was comparing the women of Samaria to these cows of Bashan who show how they were divas. They just walked around wherever they wanted, eating whatever they liked, getting fat, eating whoever's wheat they came across without a care for who planted it or who worked hard to, to make it grow and would were expecting someday to harvest it. No whim of theirs went unmet as others suffered to make it happen. Theirs was a picture of extortion, exploitation, and manipulation from the poor to bankroll an opulent lifestyle. Amos depicted these women as overbearing housewives, commanding their husbands to bring them wheat they desired, no matter what the expense or means of getting it. While these women may not have been the, the ones physically taking money and possessions from the poor, they were just as guilty as their husbands for the demands they made to support their diva lifestyles. And the same condemnation came from God on the husband as well as the wife. Now, the Greek human philosopher Epicurus, would centuries later express this same unavoidable truth lived out among the unbelieving world where he lived, proclaiming, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. That's all life, the only meaning that life has to the person who does not repent and believe and the Lord Jesus Christ has no other meaning in life other than that. Let's go down and look at verses 2 and 3. Lord God has sworn by his holiness, Behold, the day shall come upon you when he will take you away with fish hooks, and your posterity with fish hooks, and you will go out through broken walls, each one straight ahead of her, and you will be cast into Harmon says the Lord. Note, the Lord God has sworn by his holiness. These judgments against Israel that Amos was prophesying are made in God's perfect righteousness. 
The Lord says, Behold, the day shall come when ye, upon you when he will take away with fish hooks your, pros, your posterity and with fish hooks. This has been interpreted in a number of ways, depending upon the interpretation of the Hebrew. Okay, the, the women would be carried away. One interpretation is the women would be carried away in boats. So these, uh, the, this word is translated fish hooks in my translation might be translated boats. Okay, but the, the woman, another translation of that word is pots and baskets. The women will be carried away in pots or baskets like you would use to carry fish to market. Now, this interpretation would mean the women would be carried off into captivity or their corpses would be carried away like fish is in pots and baskets. The women would be dragged away by ropes is another interpretation. The Hebrew word that we're looking at here can also be translated hooks or fish hooks stating that the women would be pierced by hooks with ropes attached by which they would be taken away into captivity. The Assyrians sometimes were known to put rings in the noses or the lips of their captives and hook ropes or chains to them as they led their captives away. Keeping with cows of Bashan, this phrase could be referring to barbed cattle prods used to drive cattle. Fish hooks may be used metaphorically, saying the women had been caught like fish on hooks. The hooks may be metaphorically referring to butchered cattle hanging on hooks. The Assyrian propensity for impaling their captives may support this notion. In of any of these cases, the people of Amos's day fully understood what he meant because they had heard the reputation of the Assyrians. Verse number three, you will go out through broken walls, each one straight ahead of her, and you will be cast into harmony, says the Lord. Like Jezebel before them, these divas of Samaria would suffer, as we saw in 2 Kings 9, 30 through 37. Some would perish, while others would be driven into exile. The walls that once stood in testimony of their wealth and glory would have such large breaches in them that the women would be driven straight out of the city through gaping holes. We know from the history to come, as we just studied in 2 Kings, in, 2, in 722 B.C., the Assyrian army under Shalmaneser V and Sargon II laid siege to the capital city of Samaria, broke down its walls, and carried its survivors into captivity. That's what Harmon is. It is a place where many of these were taken into captivity. That's in 2 Kings 17, if you want to go read about it. Amos 4, 4 through 5, speaks about hollow worship. Many people are religious but they have never repented of their sins and placed their faith and their trust in Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior, okay? They just go through hollow worship, thinking hollow worship will save them. Let's see what Amos says about hollow worship. Come to Bethel and transgress at Gilgal, Multiply transgressions. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. Offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven. Proclaim and announce the free will offerings. For this you love, 
you children of Israel, says the Lord God. A second offense before the Lord God was Israel's worship had become superficial and self-exalting and had nothing to do with their covenant God, Yahweh. Amos mockingly called the people of Israel to come to Bethel so that they could continue to transgress God's laws. The people busily hurried in religious activities as they thronged to their places of worship. Every morning they offered their sacrifices on their high places before their idols. These sacrifices were supposed to be made for the atonement of their sins and to symbolize their fellowship with God through the forgiveness of their sins. God's law, first of all, does not require daily sacrifices. It is, it is, it is not intended to be a, a religion of hollow worship. Okay, God's law requires only one sacrifice per sin or at most three sacrifices per year at each one of the three annual feasts for any sins that the person might have unwittingly committed. We see that in Leviticus 1 through 5. The law required a person to bring his or her tithe from the produce of their land every three years, in Deuteronomy 14, 28 through 29. Yet, these people in their hollow worship were bringing their tithes every three days. In verse 5, Amos said to them, Offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven. With leaven means a loaf of un." A loaf of leavened bread. That means it has leaven in it. It's ra- It's been raised, much like the loaves of bread that we buy and use, okay, that have leaven in them. They're, they're, ru- they're risen bread. They're not flat bread, which does not rise because it has no leaven in it, okay? These sacrifices were supposed to be voluntary expressions, the offering of Leaven bread in the temple were supposed to be expressions of gratitude for God's blessing. Leviticus 7, 13 through 15. Further, Amos said to the people, Proclaim and announce the free will offerings. These offerings were to be voluntary, usually associated with a vow that had been kept. They were celebrating. They had kept the vow they had made to God. They they made a promise to God. They worked hard and kept their promise to God, and they came and gave these these free will offerings, and they wanted to shout for joy and 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 give praise to God because He enabled them to keep this vow. Why were these people going beyond the law of God that God required? Why were they going beyond it? The scrolls containing the written law of God were kept in the temple. There's about there's about four different reasons that they that they went beyond these these laws that God had written and given them in writing. First of all, the scrolls containing the written law of God were kept in the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem. We see that with a, Josiah in Josiah's time, where the the the, book, the scrolls of the law had been lost in the temple. Okay, they found it. They were cleaning up the temple and they found the scrolls. Okay, now, in this case with Israel, none of them any longer truly worshiped the Lord God. Instead, they worshiped the idols of the Canaanites. Okay, so they didn't care about pleasing God. They were trying to please their idols, which really, but behind their idols, the only thing was, was the, was the, the unlawful priests that were mining the temple, the, the, place of sacrifice at the high place. Okay. The people of Israel had been, the second thing is that the people of Israel had been separated from Judah and the temple for so many generations that it is likely few, if any of them, had been taught anything about the law. Therefore, they did not know these things about what the law really said. Okay, All they were doing was all hearsay. Third thing is, for 
for them in Israel, their acts of worship were about drawing attention and glory to themselves. So the more these things, quote, religious things that they did, the more righteous they appear. Okay. And the fourth thing is, fourth possibility, they had no personal relationship with the Lord God. And this is the, the this is the clincher. Okay. They had no personal relationship with the Lord God, with Yahweh, their Lord, their Adonai. So they were preoccupied with religious ceremonies and, and had no convictions at all given to them by God's Holy Spirit. The Bible says that God in the day of judgment will say to people like that, depart from me, I never knew you. His Holy Spirit had never been in presence in them. They had never repented to God and truly believed in him. So God never knew them. And they were not being led by the Holy Spirit. They were being led by a religious set of rules. Notice that Amos did not even mention any kinds of guilt offerings or sin offerings. Further evidence that there was no personal relationship with the living God through his spirit for any one of these people. They didn't know when they sinned because they had no relationship with God. So look at verse 6. Now, the Lord says that there are seven ways that the Lord had already at the time of Jeroboam II and at the time of Amos, there were seven ways that the Lord had already responded to Israel's faithfulness according to the law. And they should have seen these things as warnings. And they should have responded by humbling themselves before God and repenting of their sins. Okay? Look at verse 6. God says, also, I gave you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and lack of bread in all your places. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. So the first thing, the first of the seven ways that God had responded to Israel's unfaithfulness is God had given Israel absolutely nothing to eat. Okay? He had brought a time when they didn't have food. Cleanness of teeth is a vivid way of describing a nationwide famine. Remember Deuteronomy 28, 47 through 48, which we looked at right at the beginning? Because of the warning in his covenant with Israel, the people of Israel should have recognized the famine that was coming from God because of their sinfulness, their iniquities. <laughs> God explicitly indicated in his covenant with Israel that he would send famine upon them as a consequence of their unfaithfulness. Come down to verses 7 and 8. I also withheld rain from you, and then there were still three months to the harvest. I made it rain on one city. I withheld rain from another city. One part was rain upon, and where it did not not rain the part withered so two or three cities wandered to another city to drink wandered i'm sorry two or three cities would wander over another city to drink water but they were not satisfied god says yet you have not returned to me says the lord although he said it in his word and they and they know that they did not understand the warning given by God when it came. So the second thing that God did was a lack of rain at a time that they needed it most. Okay. Harvest season, what, what, what we see there, to understand these verses better, the harvest seasons of barley when wheat came, those came through the months of May and early June. A lack of water for three months prior to the harvest meant 
their crops would fail. God had warned them of this consequence for their unfaithfulness in his covenant in Deuteronomy 28, 23, and 24. Furthermore, God sent rain on some fields and not on others. Yet, God says, you have not returned to me, says the Lord, even though I showed you these evidences that I was judging you. Go to verse 9. God says, I blasted you with blight and mildew when your gardens increased, your vineyards, your fig trees, and your olive trees. The locusts devoured them, yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. So the third thing that the Lord did to warn them is the Lord struck with them with disease. And, and the crops that had, had managed to survive the drought were killed by the diseases. See that? It, it fell on their it's blight and mildew fell on their gardens, their vineyards, their fig trees, their olive trees. Okay. Then God sent, the fourth thing, God sent locusts on the gardens, the vineyard, vineyards, the figs, and the vine, the fig trees and the olive trees. Now, what you need to understand is, is locusts consume everything in their path. Everything green gets eaten, but still Israel refused to repent. Number 10, I sent among you a plague after the manner of Egypt. Your young men I killed with a sword, along with your captive horses. I made the stench of your camps come up into your nostrils. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. Verse 10, the Lord struck Israel with a terrible plague. Now, the Hebrew term here that's translated plague likely means the bubonic plague. The bubonic plague was one of antiquity's most dreaded diseases. It passed to humans by rat fleas. God says, when you had the plagues, yet you did not return to me. Verse, the, ver, the sixth thing God did to warn them, the sword along with your captive horses on which their cavalry rode. I made the stench of your camps come up in your nostrils, yet you have not returned to me. God had, had the, their country had lost in battle. Their soldiers and their Soldiers' horses were all killed, such that there was a terrible stench from all of the dead, rotting flesh. Okay, now let's come down to verse, verse 11. God says, I withdrew some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And you were a firebrand plucked from the burning. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. Now, the seventh thing that God did as a warning is he overthrew. <coughs> he overthrew some parts of Israel. Just like he did Sodom and Gomorrah. <coughs> Excuse me. And he says, you were like a firebrand plucked from the burning. God had allowed the, the Syrian army to besiege Samaria during the time of Elisha to the point where the people were practicing cannibalism. <clears throat> God answered Elisha's request and removed the army of Syria because one godly man within the midst of Israel, prayed to God for deliverance. God answered the prayer <coughs> of that one godly man, Elisha. And all the people saw that happen and knew that it happened. And God says, yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. 
down to verse 12. Therefore, thus will I do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. For behold, he who informs mountains and creates the wind, who declares to man what this thought is, and makes the morning darkness, who treads the high places of the earth. The Lord God of hosts is his name. Amos challenged the Israelites to prepare to meet your God, your perfectly righteous, holy God. Because of their self-centeredness, and their refusal to return to the Lord so many times in the past. There would be no more warnings and no more opportunities. Their unwillingness to return to their God would result in their God coming to them in judgment. Israel's God was one who created the mountains and the wind, who makes the darkness turn to dawn, and who treads the high places of the earth. Israel would realize their blunder only when the God of hosts came to meet them in judgment and wage war against his rebellious. United States of America, we need to know that God has warned us. 9-11 was a warning. These droughts we've been having are a warning. These politicians that we have elected who are, com are committing crazy, stupid things, that is a warning. We need to, we need to know that COVID was a warning. God is showing us with these same warnings that are in his word. We as a people need to repent of our sinfulness and believe in our Savior, our one and only Savior sent from God, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be forgiven by God of our sins. Then we will be able to walk in his spirit and live the way that we, he wants us to live. Otherwise, we don't even know what God wants. Let's pray. Father, we praise your holy name. We thank you, Lord, for speaking to us this morning. These are hard words to hear. They're difficult for each and every one of us to hear the words and to, and to put this, these ideas in order in our mind. Lord, we don't want to believe that it's true, but, Lord, we see the truth written on the very pages of your word. Lord, we ask that you would guide our hearts, Lord, and, and, and help us each to understand what you speak to us individually. Lord, show us our sinfulness. Lord, convict us to turn away from our sinfulness and to bend ourselves, our ear, closely to you and listen to your commands and do your will in our life. Lord, change us from the inside out according to our faith in your Son, our Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ. And we ask all these things for Jesus in your great name. Amen. So good to have each and every one of you here with us this morning. Hope to see you good again next week. Uh, same time, same place. Uh, God bless you. Follow him closely. Listen to his voice. We'll talk to you later.